Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Today is the day after Easter. We celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus and the new life that God gives us and assures us of through the resurrection of Jesus, which guarantees and makes possible our resurrection. Today we're going to be looking at the first reading, the second reading, and the gospel for April 16. And we're going to be talking about three implications of the resurrection of Jesus, which you'll see on the study guide. Resurrection gives us great boldness. First reading gives us new life. The second reading and meets our greatest needs and addresses our deepest fears from the gospel. First of all, gives us great boldness. The first reading is from Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Uh, fifth, seven weeks after Easter, we celebrate Pentecost this year on uh, May 28, Memorial Day weekend. But uh, I mention in the study guide, contrast the courage of Peter on the day of Pentecost with the way in which he had crumbled and denied his Lord just 52 days before on the night of the betrayal. I believe that one of the greatest evidences of the reliability of the biblical account of the resurrection of Jesus is the changed lives of the disciples. Uh, people are not willing to die for something that they know is a lie and the disciples had not seen Jesus alive, and if they knew that he had not risen, but instead they had stolen the body or whatever, they, you could not account for the changed lives of the disciples. And so I asked the question, how does the reality of the resurrection of Jesus give you boldness and courage for life? And uh, this world, this, our society, life is just filled with all sorts of hassles. Uh, on the news today was another shooting. There are so many reasons to be afraid and, and just to uh, be discouraged. Well, how does the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, something that actually happened, give you boldness and courage? Also, how does your or does your changed life give evidence for the people that you know of the reliability of the biblical account of the resurrection? And so Peter's sermon, standing with the 11, there now are 11 in addition to Peter. Remember in Acts chapter 1, a successor for Judas had been chosen. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd boldly after on the, on the day of Pentecost. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. Deeds of power, wonders, and signs, that's very much an emphasis in the book of Acts, as Acts talks about the, as Luke talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, here, Peter says, I am speaking to people who you have seen, you have experienced at least some of the miracles of Jesus. And so he's talking to people who had been eyewitnesses to at least some of them. And if they had known that that wasn't true, they would have objected to what he was saying. And so again, the fact that they accepted and did not disagree with what he said gives reliability to the gospel account. Verse 23, this man, Jesus, handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. I quote then from 1 Peter 1.20, which is going to be part of the second reading for next Sunday, April 23. It talks about Jesus as being destined before the foundation of the world. The death of Jesus was not an accident. It wasn't a, we had not anticipated this, but instead, it was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This stands in sharp contrast with a movement within Christianity today that calls itself progressive Christianity, which rejects the teaching that Jesus died purposefully for our sins, that that had been the plan from the beginning, but instead something happened that Jesus was a threat to the political and social power structures of the day and they, they were so threatened by him that they had to get rid of him, and so they crucified him. But God raised him from the dead, showing that the power of God is greater than the oppressive political and social power structures. And now the main role of the church is to join with Jesus in opposing the, the oppressive political and social power structures of our day. 
Well, in progressive Christianity, the death of Jesus was not according to the plan and foreknowledge of God, but instead it was the result of what oppressive and political social structures that were threatened by Jesus did to try to get rid of him. But here is a clear statement in contrast to progressive Christianity that the, the plan that Jesus' death was what God had been planning for, how he planned for her salvation even before the creation of the world. And so I write in the um, study guide, long before creation, long before Old Testament prophecies such as Genesis 3.15, that the descendant of the serpent would be wounded far more than the descendant of the woman. Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Long before any of those prophecies, God knew what he would do in order to accomplish our salvation. This was the plan, the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, in verses 23 and 24, you see the courage of Peter. Remember, just 52 days before, this was the, this was the man who crumbled when, when, when a servant girl in a, in, at uh, the high priest's house said, Are you a follower of Jesus? Crumbled and denied his Lord. Well, 53 years, 52 days later, having seen Jesus alive, having received the Holy Spirit, you see the courage that Peter had. You crucified and killed, direct accusatory, by the hands of lawless people, by the hands of the Romans. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I like that phrase, you did this but God. I write on the study guide, two of the best words in the Bible are, but God. God intervenes, God turns things around, God changes things. And so I ask the question, when are some of the times in your life when you experienced a but God moment? This was happening but God. You were overwhelmed by the situation but God. You did not know what you were going to do but God. There's a song by the uh, Christian contemporary group of Hillsong United I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. I'm in this situation, but God. Wonderful words. What have been your but God moments in your life? So the resurrection of Jesus gives us great, mo uh, great boldness. Second, the resurrection of Jesus gives us new life. Uh, this is from 1 Peter, the first of two letters of the disciple Peter. I added a couple verses to the second reading that Peter writes to begin this letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion, also can be translated to the resident foreigners of the diaspora. The scatteredness of the church was diaspora, like a spore, a seed, seed that is scattered in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Let's look at the map, and so we'll be able to see where these people, places are. We see at the end of 1 Peter that Peter is in Rome when he's writing, and he's writing to the Christians because as he writes the letter, you can tell that he's writing to um, mostly non-Jewish Christians. Um, but he's writing to the Christians that are in Asia, which is Western Turkey, not just the, con not the whole continent as we think of today, Bithynia, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia. The, he's writing to Christians that are scattered uh, uh, through Turkey. So Peter, writing to the exiles who have been chosen and destined by God the Father, and I mentioned in the study guide, note the Trinitarian form of the writing. The word Trinity, three triunity, one God, three persons, the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the scriptures. The word Trinity is a word that early Christians came up with in order to describe what the scriptures say about God. That God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. And so um, the uh, one God, three persons. 
So notice here, though we don't, never have the word Trinity in the Bible, we have Trinitarian language, such as at the end of Matthew 28, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or here, Trinitarian language. You have been chosen and destined by God the Father. You have been sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Note the Trinitarian form of the language. And then he says he writes to the exiles of the dispersion. Um, in what ways are we today like exiles of the dispersion, living in a world where we simply really don't belong? I remember for me, like on the day of the Super Bowl, watching the, the um, halftime show and thinking, you know, I am not obviously part of the target audience for something like that. It's just I don't relate to that. I don't fit with that. So I, I look at the kinds of movies that are playing in theaters today, and it just all looks like junk to me. It's like I, I feel like an exile. I don't belong. I really am not at home in a world that has values like this. We also are like exiles of the dispersion. And then it's interesting, um, he, um, let's see, on the study guide I mentioned in chapter 5, verse 13, where Peter is finishing the letter, and he says, your sister church in Babylon, and generally it's, it's thought to be the Christian church that is in Rome, because Rome, Babylon was the great power that opposed God in Old Testament times, Rome would be the great power at this particular time. So your fellow believers in Rome, chosen together with you, sends you greetings. And so does my son Mark. So this would be evidence that Peter got to Rome. And also the, the early tradition is that Mark, the gospel writer, got his information for writing his gospel from Peter, the eyewitness. So again, here's a reference to Peter being in Rome and also for Mark as being with Peter. But just that whole language of being exiles in Babylon. I mentioned on the study guide, there is a organization called the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. And this is something you can look it up on the internet. This is a, an organization that has publications and webinars and live seminars and so on on sexuality issues from a traditional biblical viewpoint. But I like the name that they give to their conferences. They call it Exiles in Babylon Conferences. That, that, that's just powerful biblical language that, that we who follow the traditional biblical view is like we're exiles. We live in a culture that is increasingly opposed to our traditional scriptural views on life issues. And then Peter writes, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. And so I ask the question, when have you experienced not just grace and peace, but grace and peace in abundance? When did you experience it and what was it like? I think of Psalm 23, my cup overflows. When have you just felt overwhelmed with the fullness of God's grace and it's like it was overflowing? Or John 1.16 where John says, We have seen his fullness, grace upon grace. Not just grace and peace, but grace and peace in abundance. Wonderful way of putting it. And then Paul writes, bless, excuse me, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So how does the resurrection of Jesus give you a new birth into a living hope? How have you felt energized by Easter worship, the music, the message, the beauty? How does that just give you new life? And how does that give you a living hope? And in the scriptures, hope is never just sort of an indefinite, well, I hope so, but I am not sure. Hope is a very strong reality based upon the promises and actions of God, which gives confidence for the future. How does the resurrection give you new life and confidence for the future? And then Paul writes, uh, Peter writes, excuse me, he has given us a new birth 
and also into an inheritance that what we have in Jesus is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God. And so I ask the question, what does it mean for you today to know that what you have in Jesus is not subject to the whims of the stock market or to, it's not like you've um, invested money in cryptocurrency and it's all gone or whatever, but your inheritance in Christ is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, and you are protected by the power of God. What does that give you the motivation and the empowerment to do? That as we seek to live as God's people in the world and to do God's work, we do so from a position of strength, security, and confidence, and power, and empowerment. Our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, and we are protected by the power of God. There's nothing insecure about our position as followers of Jesus. Therefore, we are motivated and empowered from a position of strength to do what God wants us to do. Now, you have this imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, protected by the power of God inheritance, but is kind of tough in the meantime. So verses 6 and 7, in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials. You know, it's, that's, we, we know the end, the, the end is secure, but there's something really tough going on in the meantime. But because I know the end, I have the strength, the security, the power, the empowerment to be able to continue on in the meantime. So I can rejoice even in the midst of my trials, because the outcome is not uncertain. So that the genuineness of your faith be more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire. Just as gold is, is refined by fire, so suffering purifies our faith and strengthens our faith. So I ask the question, how are you and your faith being tested by fire right now? Um, like, like here where, where these Bible studies are recorded. It's, um, or, or just think, we, we've just been through COVID, which was a terrible experience, and now there's road construction on Happy Valley, and how long will this go on? We know that eventually the Happy Valley construction is going to be over, and it's going to be two lanes each way, and think of how wonderful that's going to be. And so you have strength in the meantime, knowing that this, will, this too shall pass. This will someday end. But how are you and your faith being tested by fire right now? And is your faith genuine? And how is the genuineness of your faith being revealed? And are you able to rejoice because you know the end result, the outcome, the eventuality, even while you are having to suffer various trials? If you are able to, what makes you are able to do that? The scripture is consistently saying by knowing how it ends by knowing the end result. We have power and strength and courage and confidence in the meantime. Now, if the resurrection of Jesus gives us great boldness and gives us new life, how does this also gospel meet our deep, greatest needs and addresses our deepest concerns? And here we turn to the story of John of Jesus' appearance to the disciples Easter Sunday evening when Thomas wasn't there and then the next week when he was there from John 20. So I ask the question, what today are your greatest needs and your deepest concerns? And how does the resurrection of Jesus help meet them and address them? Verse 19, because the account of the resurrection of Jesus and his appearing to Mary Magdalene and Peter and John running to the tomb and so on is from John verses 1 to 18. This tells about that night. In my opinion, um, the next week we're going to be at Luke 24, the appearance of Jesus to the two followers on the road to Emmaus. And so you have the resurrection in the morning, going to the empty tomb, you have Jesus appearing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, in the afternoon. And then you have Jesus appearing to the disciples without Thomas on Easter Sunday evening, 
Those are the three things that happened on the day of Easter. So, verse 19, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, Sunday, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. The disciples were in quarantine. I remember three years ago teaching on this, and that's when we were a few weeks into the COVID quarantine. And do you remember how awful that was? <clears throat> well, oh, the, for fear of the Jews. <clears throat> we find that often in the Gospel of John, the Jews are threatening. The Jews, are, the disciples are locked for fear of the Jews. Or, or you could just see um, that probably John was written at a time where there was increased animosity between the Christians who were included Jewish people who became Christians and the, the Jews who were not Christians. And so that that um, emphasis upon the fear of the Jews or the Jews being opposed to Jesus, etc., is probably a reflection of the situation of the day. Unfortunately, it has led to anti-Semitism over the years, but that should not be the intent. Jesus died for all of us. We all crucified him, not just one group of people. So, the doors of the house were locked for fear of the Jews. And then notice that when Jesus appeared in his resurrected body, he was able to just appear, go through walls, etc. Um, but notice that Jesus does six things for them in order to meet their greatest needs and address their deepest concerns. Verse 19, his presence. He stood, he came and stood among them. Verses 19 and 21, he gave them peace. Peace be with you. Verse 20, evidence of the resurrection. He showed them his hands and his side. Verse 21, purpose and calling. As a father has sent me, so I have sent you. 22, the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And verse 23, authority. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So what did Jesus give to his disciples on Easter Sunday evening? His presence, his peace, evidence of his resurrection, purpose and calling, the Holy Spirit, and authority. That's a lot. But then verse 24 tells us that Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. He wasn't with them that night. And I'm sure, you know, of all the times not to be there, it's like the little boy that missed church on on Palm Sunday, and as when the family got home, his sister told him about the Palm Sunday procession and so on. And so the little boy said, wouldn't you know, the one Sunday that I miss church and Jesus shows up. Well, here Thomas wasn't there and Jesus showed up. But Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And, and usually we talk about Thomas as doubting Thomas. Usually Thomas is interpreted as saying, well, I will not believe unless I have this evidence. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. I don't see Thomas as doubting Thomas. I see Thomas as so much wanting to believe, but it was so much beyond what he could have hoped for that he just simply said, you know, I, I want it to be true. <clears throat> Not that he's doubting it, but I want it to be true, but it's so much better than I can ever imagine. Well, a week later, the disciples were again in the house. This time, Thomas was there. And although the doors were shut, it's interesting that it says that the doors were shut. The second time, it does not say that the doors were locked. I'm wondering whether the, the disciples were a little bit more courageous now now that they've seen Jesus alive, they can have the door shut but not locked. One possibility, Jesus came and stood among them. And he gave Thomas the opportunity to do what Thomas had said he would need to do. Imagine seeing somebody and having them being able to quote you word for word on what you had said on a previous occasion. <clears throat> but Thomas doesn't put his hand into the side and in the wounds. Instead, he says, verse 28, my Lord and my God. So I believe that we have given Thomas, so-called doubting Thomas, a bum rap. 
I quote from John 11 where at the time where Jesus and the disciples are going to go to Bethany and to raise Lazarus from the dead and, and, and the, the disciples say, but you know, we could be killed. And Thomas says, let us go also that we may die with him. I think that's an evidence of the strong faith of Thomas. And I think, so it's not that he was the doubting Thomas, but instead it's like, I want it so much to be true, but it seems far better than what I can ever imagine. And so I think instead <clears throat> we need to focus on the fact that Thomas is the first disciple recorded as calling Jesus God. Other disciples had called him son of God or rabbi or messiah or teacher or many other things. But Thomas is the first disciple to actually call Jesus God. Now, the Christian church in India and Pakistan traces itself back to the disciple Thomas. They believe that Jesus sent Thomas on missionary work into that part of the world. And so they trace themselves back to Thomas. And um, church I was pastor of in California, we had a large Pakistani community that were all related to each other. And um, a relative of theirs was at the time um, bishop, presiding bishop of the United Church of Pakistan. And I had the privilege of being able to go to Pakistan in February of 2011 as his guest, just to be able to see the Christians there. And I found them to be just incredibly courageous and committed people living in a very hostile environment. So I, I think I, I just admire the courage that they have in such a difficult setting. And they trace themselves back to the disciple Thomas, who was the first disciple to call Jesus God. For example, um, United Church of Pakistan, it's made up of, in 1970, they merged the missionary efforts of the Anglicans, the American Wesleyans, the Scottish Presbyterians, and the Swedish Lutherans. And the Swedish Lutherans were the ones that uh, had done missionary work in the Pashar area, which was uh, along the Afghan border. And I remember talking to the wife of the bishop of the Pashar diocese, and, and she was saying that he was given an opportunity to go to London and work for a mission organization there. And he turned it down because he said, you know, any number of people here would love to be able to move to London and work for a missionary organization there. But who in the world are they ever going to be able to get to be, uh, to be bishop of the Peshawar Diocese because of the, you know, the Taliban and all of the uh, terrorist activity that was happening in there. They are a people whom we need to remember in prayer, people of great courage and conviction um, as they live their Christian faith. So how does the resurrection of Jesus give you great boldness? How does it give you new life? And how does it meet your greatest needs and address your deepest concerns? And let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we see the tremendous change that took place in the life of Peter because he knew that you were alive. We pray that our, we also will have courage knowing that you are alive and that our changed lives will give, will give witness, powerful witness to the reality of your resurrection. We thank you for the fact that what we have in you is imperishable, undefiled, and kept in heaven for us. Therefore, knowing that our future is secure, we have the motivation and the power and the empowerment to be able to do with confidence what you challenge us and ask us to do. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that as you appeared to your disciples and gave them your presence, peace, evidence of your resurrection, purpose, calling, the Holy Spirit, and authority, that you have those same gifts for us today. In Jesus, your name, your risen name, we pray. Amen.